to tell you guys about is the journey I went on to finally feel worthy of your gifts. Because the truth is, is that if we don't feel worthy, we're never going to have it. Now, I had a lot of support early on. In fact, I think I won the lottery with my parents. They're the most supportive people on the planet. Not in a weird helicopter unhealthy way, just in the most supportive way possible. Praising and cheering. When my sister was 27, playing a rec league softball game on the team, she called me one day and said, I have to stop telling mom and dad about my games. They're showing up with lawn chairs and sitting on the sidelines cheering me on. They're the only parents doing it. And I'm really grateful, but it's kind of embarrassing. And of course, at this TEDx talk today, my parents are here, and they were first in line at the door to make sure they got the best seats on my TEDx talk. So yes, I had, I've had so much support in life. But it wasn't until I decided to start my own business and become an entrepreneur that I realized that that actually wasn't the key to my success. I had a lot of what I call prescribed success in life. So I had done well in school, I was in dance, and I was a cheerleader, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I went on to college and did well, I studied abroad, and out of college I got what most would consider and what I considered my dream job at a big four accounting firm. And I did very well there, but something was missing. Oh, and I even married my high school sweetheart after we took a five-year break to find ourselves. <laughs> so I had been on the path that society had laid out for me of prescribed success. And again, that wasn't bad. It was just um, not what I wanted. I felt like something was missing. So I left my job to start my own business, and that's when I really started to struggle with success when I went off the beaten path and I was trying to do something out of the norm. I had this grand vision of starting my own business. I was going to be a health coach, all online, and be wildly successful. And everyone around me was telling me, you can do it, You'll be, you're, you're so good for this, everything's amazing. But deep down, I was really struggling with finding my own success. I had this vision of waking up every morning with the sun, not even needing an alarm clock, doing a half an hour of yoga, and then making organic tea, and then I would sit down to my beautiful MacBook Pro and make all my magic. <laughs> the problem is what was actually happening is my alarm would go off and I would hit snooze 10 times because I didn't really have to get out and work for anybody. <laughs> and I would make up chores and avoid my business at all costs because I was so stuck, I didn't know what to do. I would wash every blanket in the house, and I would organize my tea drawer make sure all of my organic teas were in line. <laughs> I would do anything I could to avoid actually working on my business. Lucky for me though, I, uh, one other thing I did I wanted to tell you guys real quick because it's funny. I would sit down at Facebook and I would uh, started calling Facebook the place where people go to compare themselves to other people and make themselves feel bad. I would sit down and I would look at other people's blogs and I would look at other people's Facebook pages and I would wonder, how is she, how does she have a thousand fans on Facebook? How is she getting her picture taken with Deepak Chopra? And I would just sit there and compare myself to other people. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was going on. But luckily, as an entrepreneur, I knew I needed mentors. And two of my mentors recommended a book to me that absolutely changed my life called The Big Leap. And in this book, Gay Hendricks, the author, if you haven't read it, I so highly recommend that you read this book. He introduces you to a concept called upper limits. And an upper limit is something that happens to us where we sabotage ourselves. Everything's going really well, and once we achieve success, we'll actually sabotage ourselves to bring, it, to bring everything down. <clears throat> and if you ask people if they do that, you'll say, of course not, I don't do that. And that's what I said. I was like, of course I don't do that. <clears throat> but what, had, what was happening is, and I remember back in college I would do this. I was at Gonzaga University majoring in math, and by my senior year, I was in my fifth calculus class. Super fun. And when we would have a test, it would always be on a Friday. And I would study, 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 study for these tests. And I would walk in the test on Friday feeling pretty good. And I would usually leave actually feeling like I passed the test. So instead of doing what most college seniors would do at that point, and go out to a party or go, you know, have fun, go to a movie, I would find myself in my room working myself up into hysterics thinking something bad was going to happen to somebody in my family. Completely unfounded. I would call my mom and say, Mom, I really think you need to check on Dad. I think something's wrong with him. And of course, I'm in Spokane, Washington, there in Billings, Montana. And she would say, your dad's sitting on the 
the couch, he's fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with him. And I would try to go have fun, but all weekend I would just feel like something was wrong. So while I was reading this book, I started to, to understand that, okay, maybe I do this. Maybe I, I have some of these patterns. And there was one line in the book that finally pulled everything together for me. The author's having you do an exercise, and it's a fill-in-the-blank exercise. And he says, I cannot expand to my full potential because. And my mind said something I had never heard before, and I couldn't believe it was there. It said, I cannot expand to my full potential because there are only a finite amount of successful people on the planet. Why do I feel like I should be one of them? I had no idea that was buried in my, self -conscious, in my subconscious, but it was something I was living with. I was actually in the living room reading this book, and I slammed it down, and I looked at my husband, and I said, I don't feel worthy of success. He had no idea what I was reading. He thought I was reading a book or something. He was like, okay, you're great. Let's move on. But I didn't need him to get it because I got it. And that was the moment. I knew that success was dependent on the individual. I would have conversations with my dad when I was younger about what I was going to be. And I remember my six-year-old self thinking, if I don't do the astronaut thing, I'll probably just run for president. <laughs> I knew I didn't get that from home. I had no idea where I got that, but again, I didn't even care where I got it because I knew it wasn't true. And that was the moment that I gave myself permission to feel worthy of success. Before I read this book, I had always kind of bristled at the, the uh, term personal development. I imagined somebody in the self-help section of Barnes & Noble like cowering in the corner, flipping through the, the pages of a self-help book trying to find the meaning to life. And I felt like I had things pretty figured out, but I really liked this concept. So my second adventure into understanding personal development was an introduction to an amazing author named Marianne Williamson. <coughs> and this was the second piece of the puzzle to me. Her teaching that our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond all measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Whoa! <laughs> this is when I figured it out. I knew I wasn't afraid of failure. I had, when I had started my business, talk about self-sabotage, I wanted to have an online business, but I decided to, when I was living in Denver, approach chiropractors to see if I could work with them. So I spent all of this time and money making these binders, these beautiful color binders with all of the information about my health coaching and the products I was selling and everything I was doing. I put on my big four accounting suit and I walked into 15 chiropractors' offices in Denver. Sure, at least one of them would say yes. Not one of them said yes. And the one chiropractor that I did get to talk to uh, brought me to his office and he sat me down and he said, I'm going to stop you before you start. He said, what you're doing will never work. It's not functional and you should do something else. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I left. And luckily I knew I needed mentors and I also knew that uh, entrepreneurs needed to fail a few times. I had heard a million stories about Abraham Lincoln and about Michael Jordan and all of these successful people failing a million times before they were successful. So I knew I needed to fail a few times. And I wasn't afraid of it. What I didn't understand was that I was more afraid of shining and what people would think of me if I did well than I was of what they would think if I failed. And it was an understanding this teaching that I finally gave myself permission to play big and not be afraid of what people would think of me if I was actually successful. So these upper limits in self-sabotage, they never go away. We just have to learn how to manage them. I call them, I think they're like tactics. They don't go away, we just have to learn how to manage them. I was recently at a speaking retreat with a world-renowned speaking coach. I do a lot of public speaking in the work that I do. And it's by application only. It's a highly coveted retreat. She only takes six people at a time. And on this particular retreat, there were six women, highly accomplished women. And one of the first exercises she had us do was write down on uh, sticky notes what would, what would embody a good speaker. So we had basically between the six of us come up with like 50 sticky notes. We stuck them to the wall. And it was everything from funny, informative, inspiring, well-paced, like basically everything you would want to see in a speaker. And she took a step back and she said, well, what do you guys think? And the first thing that came to my mind was, I don't want to be all of those things. And I said it out loud. And she said, why not? And I said, she said, isn't that why you're here? 
Isn't that why you paid all this money to be here and travel a thousand miles? This is a speaking retreat. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I guess so. I guess I'm afraid of all, all of those things that people won't like me. She kind of laughed at me, and one of the other women said, well, what would you think of me if I was all of those things? And I thought, well, I'd be so proud of you and inspired, and I would love to see you speak. And she said, okay, do that for yourself. <laughs> so these upper limits, I think, you know, it's like getting healthy and fit. If we all had to get healthy and fit one time, we would do it. Everyone would be healthy and fit. We'd all look like Tom Brady and Giselle. <laughs> but the problem is, is that this stuff will continue to, continue to come up in your life. You just have to learn how to recognize it. When I was, had applied to speak at this event today, I knew I wanted to speak at a TEDx event. I always knew in the back of my mind I would speak at a TEDx event. And I happened to be on my iPad. I knew I was in the running for this event, and uh, I was at home sitting on my couch, and I was on my iPad, scrolling through the place that I used to go to compare myself to other people, Facebook. <laughs> now the place that I go to connect with 22,000 of my closest friends. And I was scrolling through my news feed, and, and uh, Cheryl Sandberg came up her organization lean in. She's the chief operating officer of Facebook, and a woman who I have so much respect for. And she did a TED Women Talk in 2010 that is one of my favorite talks that I've ever seen. And I remember just even thinking that I was in the running to do a TEDx talk, how much I wanted it, and how honored I would feel to be in the presence of such great speakers, even having that glimmer of a resume line that women like this had. And not 15 minutes later, I got the email that I was in. And my mind said, the first thing was, oh, I need to get out of that. <laughs> I have to tell them I'm sick. I can't do that. There's no way. I'm going to need to tell them I'm out of town. There's no way I can do that. It's way too scary. But luckily, I have done a lot of work around upper limits and self-sabotage, so I knew that I could play big. So I want to ask you guys two questions, and I really want you to ask them to yourselves. The first one is, do you feel worthy of your success? And I hope the answer is yes. But if the answer is no, or I'm not sure I can help you get over it really quickly right here. <laughs> Everyone on the planet is equally worthy of success. Worthiness is a birthright. It's the feeling of worthiness that we're lacking. <clears throat> and two, what do you need to give yourself permission to do in order to play big? For me, it was finally having permission to feel worthy and finally having permission to not be afraid of what people would think of me if I was actually successful. And by the, by the time I had done those two things in 18 months, I created an online business that generates six-figure annual return income. So what do you need to do to give yourself permission to play big? And you need to do it for two reasons. One, we all benefit from your success. Whether it's opening a restaurant, asking for a promotion, starting an online health coaching business. Whatever it is, everyone benefits from your success. It makes the world a better place, and it makes our community a better place. And two, and maybe even more importantly, when you give yourself permission for success, it makes it easier for everybody else around you to give themselves permission as well. You become a way shower. So imagine this world where everyone's walking around giving themselves permission for success and giving each other permission for success. Imagine what that world would look like. And more importantly than imagining it, I want you all to live there. Thank you.